So if we do not acknowledge his lordship, he doesn't have an opportunity to enlarge himself. So number one that I said yesterday, if, we, if the authority of the Holy Spirit is recognized and respected, then he will manifest himself in many ways. He will manifest, to some he will manifest his discipline, to others he will manifest his empowerment, to others he will manifest his inspiration, to others he will manifest his grace. And he will become so many different things to so many different people under the same cloud. And the more we do what he wants, we pray his prayers, we sing his song, and we dance his dance. He becomes very personal. Very... He, 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 he begins to deal with you as a specific entity. He goes into details. He administers your life, your destiny, with details. And it's as if God has left everybody to deal with you as an individual. But that is not the case. He has capacity to deal with each and every one of us as an individual. Satan doesn't have that capacity. So Satan needs to group people into groups and send the spirit to supervise them. Sp a group of womanizers. Then he sends one spirit to take care of them. Oh, you're yeah, not with me. But God has the capacity and the administration when he comes down like that to zero in on you as an individual and he begins to speak to you those words are only relevant to you they are not relevant to your wife he has he has he has the administration to manage you as a special individual project do you realize that you're not a product of a production line you have different fingerprint different details in your destiny and when he enlarges himself he begins to deal with you as that unique individual that is fearfully and wonderfully made if you are here say yeah oh my god <laughs> number two I think I may have to stop in number two Acts chapter 9 verse 1 to 5 I may need to stop in number 2 meanwhile I have till number 5 but we we need to do practicals today you know <laughs> when we talk about the presence of God it's not theoretical so when I'm through with the theory we will try to do the practical there is there is an island of reality you need to step into. See, you need to, you need to decide to walk out of the physical realm. And hey. <laughs> walk out. Now, how many of you have ever had this experience? You took time out to pray, to fast. And while you were praying and fasting, you didn't pick much from the Lord. It was when you came into the congregation like this that God began to encounter you. There is so much you can do as an individual when you pray and fast, so much. But it's nothing compared to the access that you gain when we corporately make a habitation for him to dwell in. He comes out in a measure that you will never encounter him as an individual. Never. He's too big for you to contain. Oh, you don't know. There are some, oh my. Go closer, you will know. Go closer to him. There are some encounters you will have. You will suspend from this ground. And you will know that it's risky to your health. Oh. Ask John in the book of Revelation. He said he fell as dead. Life was going out. And he, he, he laid hands on him. Instead of him to pity him, I said, oh, see John. See, no, he laid hands on him, revived him. He said, I am dead. The first and the last. <laughs> but it is easier to handle that glory when we are in a congregation.
Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 5, then I'll stop. Give you number 2. And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and de desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly they shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell down to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him Saul, Saul why persecutest thou me? and he said who art thou Lord? and the Lord said I am Jesus whom thou persecutest it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now stay with me. Those days when you are adopted into the theological university of Judaism and you come out of the first class you'll be recommended for masters under a man, a professor called Gamaliel. I'm talking about the sect of the Pharisees. Gamaliel was a height of scholarly possibilities among the Pharisees. So when you finish your degree program and you are excellent in performance, you are referred and recommended to study further under Gamaliel. So Saul was one of those privileged people that was an excellent scholar in the ways of the Torah. Brilliant lawyer. Brilliant. He could stand as an attorney to defend you in the court of the Sanhedrin because he was grounded in the realities of the Torah. So he was privileged to be one of the students of Gamaliel. And at the time, in the Jewish ruling council, the Pharisees had the greater majority in the house. J just imagine a Senate. Are you there? Then we have this party having this percentage of representatives. We have the other party having this percentage of representatives. Any time the Sanhedrin had a texture that was superior in the number of Pharisees, the, the, their philosophies will overwhelm the decisions that the council makes. And I don't have time to show you some numerous assortments. So, but at this time, the Pharisees were higher in number and that was the first time in the history of the Sanhedrin that a militia was set up to bring every stray Jew that is embracing another faith back to Jerusalem bound having been disciplined for him to renounce commitment to that new faith he has found and swear allegiance for Judaism the first time prior to this time when Saul graduated from his masters. He was one of the promising young men that would uphold the values of Judaism and he was highly zealous. So when he sees the believers coming out of church, he will threaten them, say, I will kill all of you. Because the Bible says, Saul yet breathing out threats and slaughter. He was not diplomatic about how he felt of the believers. So he breathes threats, say, hey, you will die by my hand. Not by the devil's hand, but by my hand. And he said that for so long that the believers began to say, you are just making empty threats. 
And once upon a time, this man went to Jerusalem and he was given letters from the chief priest. He was given an authority from the chief priest to translate that vengeance that they saw that he had into reality. They gave him the authority to be able to bring everyone that he believes have strayed from the faith. Deal with them and bring them like criminals to Jerusalem. I have a lot of friends in the military and they know the rules of engagement in a war situation. In a war situation, you spare women and children. Only men like us should come under gunfire. May the Lord help men in Jesus' name. But in the letter that Saul was given from Jerusalem, he was mandated to bring both men and women bound. Have you ever seen a woman bound? You will need to take inventory of many ways of crying, crying. If you want to transport the bound woman from the heart of Midrand to this place. Oh. But his marching orders included women. Bring them bound to Jerusalem. They will take an oath that they will never attend that meeting again before they are left. So you can imagine the way Paul saw how proud he became on horseback. His first assignment was international. They gave him a diplomatic passport that could access nations in this campaign. He was going to Assyria for his first campaign and the, the, in, in Damascus. Oh, it, see, you need to see this guy on horseback as he was and he was given the liberty to pick the people that would constitute his first team of marshals. And they were riding on horseback. I can imagine when they were riding out of Jerusalem, people were hailing them. Huh? And he was just, he was there on the horse like this. That was a high topic of glory for a scholar. You know what empowered him for that kind of exercise were the letters. But on the way to Damascus, he met the Lord. And the Lord did not come to greet him. He actually came to kill him. I could imagine that Jesus came with something like a machete. This is me. This is me. This is not the scripture. This is me. And I will give you reasons why I believe he came with a machete. Just this is me thinking. Okay. He said, So, so, why are you persecuting me? The spiritual reality behind the people that he was going to persecute now appeared to him. Are you following? <laughs> he said, Why? Give me a valid reason why you are doing what you are doing. The moment Saul saw him and the way he was dressed, you know the question he asked? He said, who are you, Lord? He acknowledged the Lordship of Jesus. That's why he spared him. That's why he spared him. He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But he couldn't remember where he met Jesus and persecuted Jesus as an individual. The first revelation he was confronted with, the moment he got authority to deal with the believers, was that the Lord was one with his body. And Jesus gave him a parable, and I want to stop with that parable. He says, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for you to kick against the bricks. Now, how many of you do, do you know barbed wire in, in South Africa? Do you know barbed wire here? I, I, I'm hearing no, yes. yes. You, okay. So it says, it is hard for you to kick against the barbed wire. 
What, what does it mean by that? Any time we do not de discern that he is one with his people and we re relate with his people in isolation of him, you will want to persecute his people. You will want to attack his people. He said that inability to discern him factored with his people is going to lead you to a situation where you, you will injure yourself. So anytime people do not discern the dimension that is sustained in the immortal scheme of things, they carry out actions of ignorance that will endanger their existence. And I can tell you this again and again because I was in the petroleum industry and I was a radical, radical Christian. I was not ashamed of my Christianity. You, you know, when I say I'm a radical, I, 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 it doesn't matter. You people can be a hundred from that believe something else. If I come there, I will be more than all of you because I was erratic and people felt irritated. Some people by my ways and they knew I was not going to change. And unfortunately in an office situation, if you are not a boss and you have a boss, your boss can put you in very terrible circumstances. But that was not a problem to me. It was a light, a light thing to, to bear. Light thing to bear. And um, a certain man told me that you will see. And the guy that told me that you will see actually has the power to make me see. Within that, if I'm still in that system. <laughs> Now, let me be plain to you why he said, because you would think that I was stubborn. No, calm down. Let me explain. Because somebody in the congregation said, hey, he's a stubborn man. He came to my zone. I was the head of the zone. He came to my zone for official purpose. And we finished the, the official assignment in an excellent way. Then I took him to the best hotel in, uh, in my city. And I lodged him there. Before I left, he now said I should drive off to the campus, the university where I graduated, and bring him ladies. Ah. Hey. You know, I told you, I, <laughs> my way is the way of a radical. I don't hide who I am. And I don't care how you think. I don't care what you think. I don't care how you perceive me. I don't care what book you wrote my name. It doesn't matter to me. You know, when a man is, oh. I told him, that is the same re university where I was a revivalist. I afflicted people with the message of salvation. Then I will now drive my car to the same campus. I say, ah. <laughs> So at least I wanted you to understand. So I told him, I said I was a radical evangelist on that campus. It would be impossible for me to fulfill the task you have given me. You yourself have heard of my radical ways. It's not news. However, I have comfort for you and I will bring a Bible. He pointed me and said, you will see. That was how the battle line was drawn. And indeed, he began to make me see. When you, you know, he's the one that signs promotion letters. So when it's time for promotion, ah, he will just remove my name, throw it off. And for Four years I was not promoted. When we did the exam, we were like, how many people, a hundred people in operations that did, we wrote, 
you know, they tested us. I was, I was in the best three. And because of that, they made me a unit head. That means they've already set us in motion to be in higher ranking than our own mates. But when that fight started, everybody was promoted and I was left behind. And the Lord told me the reason why he gave me the job. He said, you will invest in many destinies. Because I was, I was in the oil industry and compared to the average salary of every other person in any other sector, we were way, way higher. So I asked him, why are you giving me this money? He said, you will invest in many destinies. So I took my diary where I wrote that thing down and I went to him for 48 hours. I said, did I fail you on this mandate you asked me to accomplish? Did I fail you with fasting? And that was what I was telling him for 48 hours. After 48 hours, I believed he had heard me. So I closed my Bible and I, I went up. The 48 hours was Saturday and Sunday. Monday morning, I was in the office. I got a call from the headquarters that the CEO of our establishment was coming to my zone. And that's not, no, that's not a good sign. Because when he comes like that, he must find fault with you. He's so strict. He must find fault with you. I say, what problem is this? We went, parked our cars on the road. When he saw us coming, he parked. I said, you are the man here? I said, Yes, I'm the man. Then we drove into town, took him to the hotel. We went to the, my office. He said, who furnished this office? Because they didn't give us money to furnish the office. I furnished it. My, I said, you furnished the place? Hmm. This man, I'm telling you, <laughs> is very strict. Is oh. Then he called me. He said, in the line of this, our duty, if we have a situation like this and this and that, what will you advise that we do? I said, based on this and this and this, we should do this. He said, hmm. Okay, what if we have a situation like this and this and this, what will we do? I said, in this situation, we need to do this and this and this because even though the textbook says this and this, this is how it is on ground. And you people in the headquarters don't know what is on ground. We know. He said, hmm. Those two questions he asked me were questions they were struggling with in management meeting. He came to find the... The man was so nice to me. He was so nice that I became afraid. Maybe he's, he's acting. When he went back to Abuja, he asked that same guy, go and bring that boy's fire. Then he saw that for four years I was not promoted. He said, write a promotion letter for this guy now. And um, backdate all his payments. Okay, that's how I built my house. That's how I built my house. The country was saving for me. That's not all, that's not all, that's not all. Six months later, he became promotion season again. He called him again and said, you know that boy? Write another one for him. So they're back to, oh my God. So I had two promotion letters in one year and I went back to where I was with, with, with the money. They saved money for me. That's how I built my house. This is the question I have for you. The man that said that we see, when he was signing the letter, where did he face? Did he face here or here? Why are thou persecuting me?